Welcome to my basement, everybody. We have a terrific guest lined up for you guys today. His name is Greg Kasavin, and he is the creative director at Supergiant Games, and they have been making fantastic titles for a while now. But Greg has one of the best stories in the whole video game uh, medium, you know, the whole history of video games. We're going to dive right into that. They have just released Hades. Uh, it's at version 1.0. It was in, uh, you know, early access for a while on the Epic Game Store, but now you can pick it up on Steam and you can pick it up on the uh, Nintendo Switch, which was uh, revealed just yesterday as we're recording this, as a matter of fact. But Greg Kasavin, please welcome to Vic's Basement. Thanks for joining us, pal. Yeah, thank you for having me on the show. It's good to see you again. It's been a while. It has been a while. You know, we would uh, generally, I think, bump into each other at GDC or yeah. E3. We'd pass each other in the halls, but uh, this is the way it is now. <laughs> Basements connected to living rooms, connected to kitchens. Attics, is, in, in my case. So, <laughs> in yeah. Attics, yes. How has it been going for you this year? Has it been all right? And well, you guys have been dealing with distributed development right from the get go, so it probably hasn't been that. Yeah, weird for th you? no, for sure. That that aspect of um, you know, apart from everything else going on in the world, the part where we all had to work from home was not that big of a distraction for us because we yeah. have been used to it and some folks at Supergiant have been working remotely uh, since the start and we kind of would work remotely part of the time so we were just like okay we're all going to start working from home we figured it wouldn't necessarily last this long um because we uh we started doing it at the beginning of March but yeah I mean we if from a work standpoint we didn't we didn't skip a beat really we you know we just launched a game so it evidently didn't mess us up too bad but of course it you know it takes its toll on everybody individually and in other ways all this stuff but i i think the work uh, for me personally it's really helped to have something like this to just kind of be gunning for it um that's, something to focus awesome. on when did you guys kind of prep this uh idea of launch you know stealth launching hades on uh, nintendo switch was this something that you always had in the works or did it come through you know, your partnership with Epic and Nintendo was playing the game and saying, look, we want this on our platform. we It's been in the works certainly for a little while. Um, we, yeah. um, you know, we, as you said, we launched in early access on the Epic Game Store back in uh, December uh, 2018. Yep. And then we came to Steam about a year later. So we expanded our early access that way. Um, okay. And then... And then we always planned to, we always hoped the game would be available for at least one console um, by the time we uh, were ready to launch in version 1.0. And the Switch was the one that we were just the most excited about. Uh, we, we thought that the, like kind of the entire design of the game, it just felt like it was going to make for a really exciting game to be able to play, you know, kind of as much or as little as you want and on the go and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, we'd been talking to Nintendo for a while. Um, they were really excited about the idea of just kind of just putting it out there you know no no previously announced release date and we were um we were excited about that too because it's kind of full circle for us since we uh announced the game in much the same way that was back at the game awards in 2018 right. where, where right. the game was first revealed and we said it's out you can you can get it in early access right now <laughs> so for us there was something nice about um yeah the start uh, kind of ending it the way the way that we started Dude, I, I got you, you, but prior to making games, you were in games media for a long time. And one thing that I'm definitely uh, becoming increasingly aware of as somebody that's been in the media business for a long time and has spent a lot of time packaging stuff and sending it out there, um, you know, live content is so big. It's so huge and important. You know, our mutual friend Jeff Keeley has really focused his whole attitude and his whole, you know, thoughts about creating content in this space about huge live events. And it's a it's a new way of people consuming stuff, um, and be, I think it sort of has to do with how much stuff gets made, right? Like the right. discoverability is an issue no matter how you release anything these days. But live um, really kind of keeps you in that space for a long time. We're seeing Twitch just flourish from something like this, and YouTube in different ways. Re stealth releasing a game is almost a, a, a perfect, you know, parallel for that sort of live consumptive audience in a way, isn't it? Because you can have people like actually being, you know, midstream and then say, oh my God, this just launched and, and boot up your game. 
Yeah, I think that's kind of the that's the hope of it, right? Like it's exciting. You see something, you see something cool, and then the punchline is, and you could play it, you know, right now. It's not going to be Q4 2021 or something. It's like immediately available. And yeah, I mean, it is like especially in the fall, uh, as as you well know, it it just there's so many games coming out all the time. It's really hard for any game to get noticed ever. Yes, but it's yes. especially difficult in the fall. Um, so yeah. you, and and for smaller teams like ours, you know, we're not. It's not like we get a pass just because we're small. We're still essentially competing with, like any other game that you know wants to wants to get picked up right now, be it a Call of Duty or what have you. So it's like, as a, as a small developer, what can you do? You have to. Yeah. Uh, you have to come up with something to get people to actually, you know, take notice of your game. One of the best things you could do is try to make a very good game, uh, in the first place. Uh, but but. I think it's just about any developer would tell you it's not actually enough. Um, it usually no. isn't like you have to, yeah. you have to find some way to get it in front of people. And um, you know, Nintendo is uh, one of those companies that has a, uh, obviously a much bigger audience than super giant games has. So the idea that they could put Hades in front of, in front of their players, it's, it's like really exciting to us because we haven't, you know, Bastion and Transistor, uh, two of our earlier games, they're available uh, also on the Nintendo Switch, but they came yeah. to the Switch kind of much later than their original launch. So it wasn't like a, uh, not not to downplay those games, I think they still hold up really well, but it wasn't like yeah. a necessarily a big event when they came out um, on the Switch. Whereas, you know, being able to launch one of our games on the Switch for the first time, it's it was very um, exciting for us, just like as whatever, long time Nintendo fans. And, and it's, certainly the pickup on Hades is going to lead to people discovering Bastion and Transistor as well, I would imagine, right? Uh, I mean, we, we could hope. Uh, we were just talking about this yesterday that um, we, you know, we're a small team and we, each of our games has been different. And it, it's really fun to have players discover our games and kind of like, in like a semi-random order. Like, you know, these yeah. days people don't start with Bastion and then, you know, play all the way up to Hades or something like that. In fact, I think yeah. we're increasingly, you know, Bastion is almost 10 years ago. So we're increasingly hearing from players who like, you know, that that's that may be the least, the game that they've heard of the least out of our games. Um, but but they do, you know, then if, if they enjoy Hades or something like that, they, they may well want to seek those games out. And I think they're really fun connections between our games that are, they're kind of more spiritual, I would say, because they're not, the game, uh, the games aren't like explicitly related to each other. They're not sequels or anything, uh, no. but you could definitely see the the DNA through them because it's it's basically the you know the same people working on them. Year it's after got year. the super giant feel. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the pickup of uh, the Nintendo Switch? Like, wh what kind of a boost did, did did you see something like? Was it amazing to see the sales numbers even within this twenty four hour cycle? So right this second, uh, Hades is the number one uh, best selling game on the on among all downloadable games on the on the Switch. Uh, I was That's awesome. Yeah, like if you go to the eShop, I don't know when when folks are going to hear this, but as of <laughs> September 18th, <laughs> 1 12 p.m. Pacific time. I don't know how long it's going to last, but we, we hit that. We, we got up there, and it's it's a tough climb. Uh, there's a yeah. lot of really good games on the Switch. There Nintendo, sure are. You know, yes. Nintendo's launching like a, um, the, 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 Mar like it launched today, the, um, uh, what's it called? The Mario 3D All-Stars. So yes. we're, we're kind of up against a Mario game. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's tough. So um, we're... Man, I, I haven't fully absorbed that yet. Um, we, you know, like we knew people liked this game a lot from from our early access development, but it doesn't it doesn't guarantee anything whatsoever. Um, because once a game you know stops be, being early access, you kind of stop getting a pass on certain yes. things. Yes. And and a lot of people come into it fresh, and they may not. They're just going to have a really different experience than people who've been kind of playing it over time and maybe have become invested in seeing it kind of evolve. How, um, how important is that early access period for you guys? I think this oh, was the boy. first time you guys have done this, right? Or did you do it on transistors? It, no, it is, well? it is very much the first time we've done an early access game. And it's um, early access is like part of the reason we wanted to do it is because it was like antithetical to everything we've ever done in the past. It felt like right. on the face of it, it felt like the most kind of wrong thing we could do because we've previously made these kind of, you know, these crafted kind of relatively linear beginning, middle and end 
types of games where you play them, you hopefully have a really positive experience and then, and then you move on. You don't stick with them for like dozens of hours. So they're not designed around replayability like Hades is. And they would have utterly failed in early access because frankly, they weren't like worth playing until they were done. Um, right. Whereas something like Hades, it was designed around replayability and designed in like a modular way where we could we could kind of release a like a so-called minimum viable product as it were it's like a shorter version of the full game but but it feels pretty complete and should be fun you know for what it is and then we keep expanding right. upon that and and i mean early access is you know the game is getting these amazing reviews now it's the reason it's as good as it is it's just like like i i mean we we wouldn't have made it at all if not for early access but but if we were to have done that it would just be way smaller and way worse just straight up and the the thing that was amazing to me is that early access even helped like the narrative portion about uh, of it like wow. the story um and i think that's one of those things that people would not expect that like oh you can't do a story game in in early access because people are just going to play it over and over and they'll get sick of it um, that's but, fantastic so then early access must have been in the design construct of hades there yeah. are still people out there i mean this game has been in the uh you know in the video game space for a while now but there are still people out there that don't know what hades is do you have true. a uh, do you have a, a you know a, a 60 second kind of discussion point about how you would explain Hades no, to people? Yeah, of course. It's a, it's a, I should have mentioned, it's a, it's our roguelike uh, dungeon crawler where you play as the son of the god of the dead and you're trying to escape from the underworld of Greek myth. You've had a blowout fight, kind of screw you dad type of moment. And you're like, I'm getting out of here. So you start fighting your way up out of the underworld, kind of like a reverse Diablo. So instead of going to hell, you're fighting your way out. But, uh, you know, you're in the underworld. So what happens when you die? You're already in the place where all the dead go. You wind up right back in front of your dad who chews you out, calls you a moron, and you try to start over and keep keep going. And you get a little bit stronger, you you know, more of the story unfolds. And it has um it has quite a bit of like humor to it, despite the seemingly dark veneer of a game set in the underworld. Uh, I think it's like uh in fact very faithful to Greek myth, although no experience with Greek myth is expected, uh, let alone required. Um and mm -hmm. we just were really inspired by the Greek gods as um, as basically a big dysfunctional family wanted to use them as a means of telling like a a story about uh, big uh, messy family situations um, and I it love just it. Uh, yeah it's players have a lot of fun with it they discover more story kind of every time you play it feels a little bit different. I did a couple runs this morning and it's absolutely gorgeous. It's a beautiful game. And you guys, you know, you've both Bastion and Transistor just blew my mind. You know, you've got a pedigree there that's uh, very evident and very clearly you, you're methodical and you labor over it and you have, uh, you know, kind of uh, an aesthetic that you must achieve. And I wonder how much of that is adapted when you've let it out, you know, you've let the world kind of critique you and give you bug reports and feedback on every single element. Is it, was it uh, e an ego check for you guys or was it welcome? No, I mean, that's a, it, that's a great uh, question because one of the, you know, one of the fears for us going into early access is like, well, you know, yeah, traditionally we've had these specific ideas for our games. We want to make them a certain way. And, and is this game kind of going to be taken away from us um and right. we start doing all this weird stuff just because the community demands it or something like that and we think that's not even what our that's like not what our players would want right like fans of our of bastion or transistor or pyre they're gonna they want us to just make another game they don't want us to listen to random dudes on the internet right they just want yeah. us to do our thing uh but um i think we you know we we got an amazing uh early access player base and i think we just kind of framed our relationship with them in a in a really like constructive way where we said we made very clear it's like hey all like give us feedback about absolutely everything but the thing we value most of all is your personal experience with the game you can give us suggestions you can tell us what weapons you want to want us to add and what characters but know that what we want to know most of all is how the game was for you um mm. because that gives us the most information and we're gonna still pursue our ideas for the game because we know where we want it to go but your feedback will help us make sure that our ideas are coming across as effectively as possible and that we're just kind of don't have blind spots um both in in the design and the narrative kind of across the board so 
the early access feedback really like refines the game. Um, it gives us a lot of, it just like our early access updates released, you know, in a more stable, like more bug free format than our, than our fully shipped games in the past. <laughs> like it gives you that just a ton of testing. Right. Um, yeah, and, for and sure. so it just, it just makes the whole thing better. And I think, um, you know, the way that we set up kind of uh, feedback giving, um, worked out really well. It did make the pace like really relentless because yeah, you are getting feedback on everything like all the time. Oh yeah. Yeah. But sleepless but, nights. Uh, you know, <laughs> here, here or there perhaps, <laughs> but, but I mean, it's, it's like we, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we work hard at this stuff because we, we love it. And it's, it's something it's like, it's such a, for someone like me, it's, it's just such a big opportunity to create something that can make a lot of people happy. Like I, I want to, I want to work hard on something like this, um, to, to That's make so the most cool. of it. Well, it's evident, so. man. Um, does the feedback come, uh, you know, with an attitude of wanting to help, or is it a, is it across the board? Do you also get kind of like some of the, the the maybe some more hardcore, nastier type messages as well that cut to the quick? I, I mean, uh, for sure, it comes in all varieties, um, and yeah. and sometimes you know, sometimes that harshest feedback, even if it's not kind of delivered in the most kind of let's say diplomatic fashion, it's yeah. some of the most important. Like right. sometimes, sometimes you need the rude awakening on something. I don't know if I can think of a specific example. I'm saying that kind of more generally, but yeah, like we, we don't want our players to like sugarcoat it and like be nice. I, I mean, it's nice when they're nice, but we, we, yeah. we want the feedback and, and we'll take it whatever form they're going to provide it in because That's ultimately awesome. it's like someone, Hey, it's someone taking the time to play your early. They're like, they're, they're helping you make your game better or, yeah. or at least and, they uh yeah so we owe them and something. they know that right like they they understand that they have a role to play here and it's yeah. fascinating to me you know especially especially this line of conversation because your roots as an editor in video games you said something about people wanting uh, you want the feedback to be about their emotional connection to the experience and that's something that i always relayed to my review teams on the shows as well as you people can get the feature information relatively easily. What they want to hear is how you feel and how you personally are imbued into that experience and what you know you got from it. And it sounds like was that a philosophy you also employed as an editor? You worked at GameSpot for a long yeah. time. Was that you know my uh, uh, like at GameSpot? I was actually like more in. I I, I suppose it may be more of. A, more of like an old school mindset almost not though, though of course you've you've been around the block your, yourself but like yeah. in, in my case I was I wrote r reviews more in the style of like describing the game L like I wouldn't use the first person I wouldn't say gotcha. I I you know I was amazed by I would say it was amazing which which right. I think today is is a, a is a less uh, popular approach and seen as as like trying to kind of present objective truth where there isn't any and i was yeah. at the time actually more interested in trying to capture that sense of like what is what is this what is this game really you know describe it thoroughly as a product less as an experiential device you know, you know i think we i personally tried to i tried to reconcile the two i recognize yeah. that games are both they're yeah. they're not they're not just art for art's sake. You you do in fact buy them. You you yeah. you 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 buy them. You make a choice with your time and money. It, it is on some level a product, um, and and it has like functionality that may or may not work and stuff. So I totally. think it's like a kind of a messy question because I you know I work at Supergiant Games. We people say really nice things about our games, um, but yeah, I'll I'll be the first to admit that there is like there there's both art and and like commercial interest in mind like if we didn't sell our games we wouldn't be able to make our games so 100%. being able yeah. to sell our games is is important to us and when yeah. a lot of people give us really good reviews and 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 uh, and play and like a lot of them play our games we take that as a sign of the game's success it's like yeah. hey a lot of people enjoyed this that's awesome um so we, we um you know we're we're fortunately not like again if you're familiar with our games you know we're not just kind of chasing after what 
like what the market wants or something necessarily no. but like we we do of course we want to make games that a lot of people would enjoy while, while not necessarily just like optimizing around you know how do we get the most people it's like it's you're it's, not it's, you're not making battle royales right now Let's yeah i mean in, i i like battle royales obviously i mean i i i would never say anything like games like my son plays Fortnite like every day absolutely loves it it's incredible yeah so it's yeah. not like um it's not like we we're above Oops. something like that um it, it, it's it's just yeah we kind of doing things our own way but um recognizing that it's kind of art and commercial at the same time i guess of course yeah and you, you know we we know kind of that super giant started off um as a dream with a, a small collective how much of the way that you make games and inter, you know work uh, interconnectedly has changed and adapted are you guys all better game makers do you have shorter fuses do you all have uh -oh. the same kinds of relationships and friendships as as you did you know 10 or 12 yeah. years ago when you started this journey yeah no uh, no i mean it, it's really like you know the fact that all seven of us uh, from the Bastion days are still working together in our respective roles. I think that I think that's something we're just like genuinely proud of at this point because it's that's awesome. It's hard to it's hard to just keep going in this industry. Um, it, not just as an individual, but um, as a as a collective, you know, as a as a small studio or anything like that. We've yeah. grown from seven. Um, we're close to about twenty uh, people now, but you know, I think that's still on the smaller side, um, yeah. and that's allowed us to really preserve a lot of the like essential work practices that we've always had that that we think are like part of the part of why we've been successful that we can to the extent that we have anyway that that we we could just move quickly on things and individuals at supergiant have a lot of ownership over their respective craft and are just kind of like free to do their best work um for lack of a better way to put it and then we find ways to kind of put it all together and call it a game uh, to really oversimplify uh, our development process. But as far as how our relationships have evolved, that's really interesting because, you know, I, I was always the old man uh, at Supergiant, but like <laughs> the folks who were, you know, in their early 20s or whatever, when we started they're you know, they have families and kids and stuff like that. It, it changes things. But yeah. for us, the sustainability of the whole thing is so important because we want to be able to keep going. So, and we can't just treat it like a startup company 10 years later. Um, no. Because we were we were working out of a living room of a house, like we can't do that uh, for ten years necessarily. Um, <laughs> so so we've gotten we've found ways to make the work just sort of fit uh, with the rest of our lives. I think more and more, and and uh, yeah, have learned a lot about each other and how to kind of n navigate each other's uh, personality quirks, recognizing that our personality quirks are like what make our games unique. I think. Wonderful. That's awesome. Where, where is HQ for Supergiant? Is it in the Bay Area? It's in San Francisco, uh, of course, you know, deserted <laughs> right now, yes. but yeah, yeah. it's and kind of got, in the heart. You're, you're reevaluating that probably. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I, I think we, uh, I think we have our fingers crossed. We'll, we'll be back there at some point. Um, and in fact, actually it's not deserted at all. Uh, Amir Rao, uh, uh, our studio director and one of the two co-founders, he's, they're right now street like live streaming Hades on Steam. So oh, that's he, so cool. Yeah, he's there. It's just we're not we're not all working uh, out of the office day in and day out. That's awesome. D were the roles that were carved out when you guys launched Supergiant? Um, did they change much, or they, did you guys kind of just, just, you know kn knew your path and stayed on that path? Yeah, you know they really have not. Um, they really have not changed much. Uh, broadly speaking, like mm. I, I started, you know, doing writing and design, um, kind of working on the worlds of our games, developing the stories and, you know, putting the actual words into them and building some of the content. That's ex exactly what I still do now. Um, our games are bigger, so we do like more of it. But, you know, going going down the list, it's like Amir, our studio director, he still he, he, like gets into the nuts and bolts of the design. He's still like you know, tuning all the all the combat and the progression systems and so on. Gen Z, our amazing art director, she is still our art director. Thankfully, no longer the sole artist on the project <laughs> for her sake. Uh, but you know, now she so she leads a team now. Um, but she's still the one you know designing our characters and and 
um, and developing the entire look of our games. And of course, um, you know, Darren Korb, our incredible composer and audio director, he still, you know, every piece of music that we've had in our games is all from him. Um, he's like doing, he does a ton of voice work in Hades also. So he is just a, a wellspring of incredible talent. So I think we just try to like, we actually just try to build games around the specific talents of the individuals that we have. It's it's not like we have a game idea and then try to try to make sure we could do it. It's like what can I think about? What can Darren do extraordinarily well? As a, he could play all sorts of amazing music, but there's certain types of music he could do really really well. So let's have stuff like that be the musical style of our games. Just kind of let so cool. set, set everybody loose uh, just doing the stuff that they're excited about. And, and you can feel that when you play your games, you can feel that, that you know, personal DNA, that personal kind of uh, injection of uh, uh, creativity, which is, I think, part of the the staying power and the, you know, the evergreen quality of, of the titles that you guys are are creating that's fantastic do you do you work with external developers too do you do you get any stuff done out of house we do like we worked with an external uh, engineering team uh, for example as, as part of uh, making hades work as well as it does on nintendo switch there was a lot wow. of like hardcore uh, engineering work that needed to happen because we've been using our we have our own uh tech and tools and it basically needed a major major overhaul to be able to like work on the switch period much less yep. uh run smoothly so but we we absolutely do work um with external teams uh sometimes but for the most part you know the like the content of our games is all uh that's all just done done by our small team internally that's so cool do you do you get approached by unity and and uh unreal to use their stuff or do you guys prefer that you you're sort of owning the way yeah. that you're driving forward yeah we do you know we like there are some downsides to having your own tech like the thing i just mentioned where it was you know with unity you could get a unity game onto multiple platforms um i i don't want to downplay how incredibly difficult everything is in game development but unity is like designed yeah. uh, to be multi-platform as one of its yeah. big advantages whereas our tech really uh needed a lot of help uh on that so that's a downside of it but on the plus side it like is precisely created to make the kind of games that we want to make and the tools right. are like they're like custom tailored to us as individuals like when we need a tool updated it's like yo gavin can can you make it do this yeah no problem and so unity isn't <laughs> gonna like hook you up like that necessarily so um having having efficient tools is is like incredibly important for a small team because if you're if your tools suck and you're like you can't make content quickly then you're you're in deep trouble because you're already you know few in number um you yeah. need to be able to like do your work as as efficiently as possible without getting super frustrated that your tools aren't you know doing what you want them to do well you know you, you mentioned having your stuff on multiple platforms i think that's something that we can associate with super giant you know you, yeah. it, it's amazing to me and i don't know how you guys all felt about it being able to play bastion on an iphone or yeah. you know you can walk from screen to screen and there's your stuff was that just mind-numbingly difficult being able to kind of think out of the box and then also do all of the you know work after the work to be able to get this stuff running all over the place yeah i i mean we have done many of our like, like uh the the version you mentioned bastion came to ipad i think over a year man it was like a year and a half after its initial release and we were yep. working on it for a good portion of that time so that in particular was like um, it was a big uh, technical undertaking and it was a big design undertaking, making it right. like, suitable for touchscreen devices and so on. And we kind of went into every single level, you know, making touch-ups and retuning the difficulty and stuff just based around how you interact with it. Um, so those are really, they're really actually interesting um, design challenges. And we, we do them because we're excited for them, right? No one's telling us you have to bring Bastion to the iPad. We're like, whoa, this is a, this is a cool opportunity um to to maybe like introduce this game in a in a whole new way and so i think we have always been drawn to like trying something new on those fronts of course our games are available on on more traditional consoles and stuff as well but many of those projects are very much kind of one at a time like we're 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 too small to be able to go like super broad and just kind of sim launch on every platform right. under the sun because it, it would just that come at a actually... huge 
Yeah. It might work to your advantage though, because there is this um, stream of content that, that people are aware. Yeah. Like every time you launch on another platform, it's another way to tell people that you're out there with your game, as opposed to, you know, one and done and it's everywhere in a way, right? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I do think about that a lot. Like I think Bastion, you know, the, the, uh, the common wisdom is like, oh, you're releasing it so late. You should, you know, take advantage of your one big marketing beat. But I think Bastion for, uh, for iPad and iPhone, like really benefited from coming later because by then people had heard of Bastion and had heard right. that it was actually good. Um, and, and it's kind of uh, pedigree as it were kind of preceded it or it's quality preceded it. Um, yep. Whereas if it were available, you know, day and date with the Xbox Live Arcade version, I don't think anybody would have would have cared about it. So it yep. was it was interesting how that worked out for us. That's awesome. Do you have, um, I, you know, a, 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 a larger percentile part of your community specific to one platform? Like where, where do most of the Supergiant fans play your stuff? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting because like numerically we do have like tons of people who play uh, on our, on like iOS devices. Like the, the number of people who've played Bastion on, on iPads is, is, is very large, but we hear the most directly from people like playing on PC and console, I would say. Like those are the folks, you know, in general, more likely to like send us an email or reply to a tweet or something like that. And, you know, we message board communities. So um, I, on a personal level, I sometimes feel like closer to that type of audience, even if it's not like, n even if it doesn't numerically always correlate to like exactly the the share of, of the audience or something. So that's cool. Uh, so yeah. as a developer, though, you totally recognize the value in bringing ostensibly these these massive single player story based experiences to a platform and and there's a price associated with them and the you know phones and tablets really have been thriving on free to play and and uh, you know games as service models but you guys have had terrific success in that field yeah at least at least in the you know bastion and transistor are our two games available on on mobile devices i think that market has evolved even more since the release of those games. So I, I honestly don't know if, like, if we had to do it right now, we would, we would have to think about it differently. Because man, the the one thing that moves even faster than like the console market is is like the the mobile yeah. the mobile m market. But we were we were fortunate to be able to like, I guess, persuade people to be willing to spend their five bucks or whatever to to buy a game e even still like those versions of our games do cost less than than like say the console versions and it's not because they're like inferior it's 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 really because that's like where yeah, yeah that's where, where the market's at you also have the opportunity to reach billions of people across that stuff though as well which is pretty yeah. incredible too yeah yeah that's awesome you started in um did did you start at a games retailer by chance? Did you work at an EB uh, GameStop or anything, or was no, Games I, I Media never, your first stop? Yeah, Games Media was my first stop. I started writing about games like straight out of uh, high school. Like doing back then, it was like actual printed uh, fanzines, like you know, printed out, and mailed in the <laughs> like mailed by mail to people who would send you you know two dollars or something. But that That's led awesome. to that led to small freelance jobs and eventually an internship. At GameSpot that had just started. This is in 1996, so um, I, I was I was still I just started uh, college recently, so I worked there kind of all all through college and worked there full time afterwards. And I, I wouldn't have expected to, you know, that 10 years would fly by doing. I I, I love that work a lot. Um, I just I know like, it was a hard decision from you to for for you to leave yeah. the world of games journalism to go and make video games. You were the EIC at uh, GameSpot yeah. by the time you left, yeah? Yeah, that's right. How, how long were you in charge of all of that? For, it, for about, like, I was, my title was executive editor from, man, I think I want to say about 2002 on. Um, so, and we didn't, like, we didn't have the title editor-in-chief at all. Uh, so yeah. I was essentially running the edit, editorial department from 2002 until 2007. Uh, the, be uh, the beginning of 2007 is when I left. So That's yeah, awesome. had my little stretch during kind of the GameCube, uh, Xbox, Play PlayStation 2 era. 
a golden era, right? Yeah, it is. An incredible it time. It was. I, like, as I mean, I'm playing Super Mario 3D All-Stars today, and last week it was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 yeah. and 2. Like, it's, it really is like, wow, we had it so good. And, and the yeah. amount of releases and creativity that was happening back then. Yeah. But an inspiration for all of you guys that were starting your own studios and, and uh, uh, starting small but with, with massive dreams, you must have hit a... a um, uh, and I don't know if you stopped to pause and think about this, but you must have hit a point in your career where you were as many years into making video games as you were about writing them, you know, yeah. sort of that midpoint. Did you reflect on that and reflect oh, yeah. on that, that journey? Yeah. Yeah. That, so that's not too, oh God, I guess it is kind of long ago now because yeah, uh, it would have been 2017 that I hit my 10 year mark um, since, uh, yeah, uh, since becoming a full-time game developer. I definitely re reflected on it. Above all, it was weird. Uh, you know, as you get older, uh, one of the one of the horrible phenomena is that time seems to accelerate. And, you know, yeah. t 10 years, uh, this last 10 years, you know, it, it's like no big deal. Whereas the stretch between, you know, 20 and 30 for me, that's like, oh man, that, that feels like half my life, but it was only a 10 year stretch. Um, yeah. So, the GameSpot years feel like they were longer, even though now I've I've like been a game developer uh, longer than that. Um, and I still, you know, think back fondly on on my GameSpot years and get to like at least vicarious, you know, some yeah, folks like yourself and the folks at Giant Bomb. It's like I love I love that there are folks still kind of making it happen um, yep. after all this time. That's obviously kind of an industry that also has been through a great deal of, of change and really hard oh, to yeah. keep, oh, yeah. stick to. Yeah. <laughs> so, All of it though, man. I mean, the, the iPhone, uh, Steve Jobs was right. You know, he stood up on stage and this said, this is going to change everything. Yeah. He, boy, did it ever no, change everything. It did. Yeah. yeah. When he saw that, like, huh, really? And yeah, turn, even the iPad, I was very skeptical about the iPad. I'm like, it's just a big iPhone. It's like, nope, turns out <laughs> yeah. it was kind of important. So, turns out we all want to walk around with televisions in yeah. our hands all the time. We want to be able to access content all the time. Um, how much do you think, and did you predict this, the years you spent analyzing and, and critiquing and, and crafting editorial and, and discussion around this medium was going to benefit you as a, a creator in the medium? And, it, I, and was it necessary? I, I um, Was it necessary? No. Um, I, it was it, for me, it was actually a, a, a plan B because I, you know, I wanted to make games since I was eight years old playing Ultima four on an Apple two C and was like blown away by this big, essentially a big open world computer role playing game, very similar to ones that are made now just with primitive graphics by comparison. So yeah. I knew, I knew then and there, uh, but every time I tried to like teach myself programming, which was a traditional way, you know, you got to program it It man, my brain just did not jibe with programming. It just did not stick for me. But I loved writing a lot. So I'm like, man, I'm playing games all the time. I need to I need to kind of justify the gross amount of time I'm spending just playing them. So I'm, I'm going to start writing about them. And then, yeah, like I said, that, you know, turned into a 10 year uh, career or more or more than 10 years. It was all, it was 10 years at GameSpot, but I've been doing it for a couple of years uh, prior to that. But then, yeah, it was like one day, you know, I'm close to 30 years old at that point, And I'm like, oh, my God this time uh this time went by in a flash and i'm i'm no closer to becoming a game developer i just have to like all i knew i would regret it if i never tried it basically right um i, yeah. I figured maybe i'll be able to come crawling back to to the gaming press you know chances are this won't work out but i gotta at least give it a shot and i do think um i did tell myself that um the the time i was able to you know i played so many games at GameSpot more than like a person reasonably would be able to otherwise. And I also yes. got to play bad games, which is great. Yes. Um, bad Very games important. Have, yeah, yes. there's so much to teach. It's actually something I, re man, I catch myself. I'm like, I wish I played more bad games now yeah. because I only, it's hard to make time for good games, much less bad ones. Um, Dude, but, I, I feel the same way yeah. because not, not necessarily I personally would play all the bad games, but I was, you know, fortunate enough to have a team of people around me that was making content and we would cover everything. And I, so all the bad games got talked about and it was fun to make fun of them. It was fun to make content around them. But there were also these little nuggets of great... Yeah observation that comes out of looking right. at that stuff right exactly and i and i don't yeah and and to be clear like 
with what you're saying, yeah, I don't mean bad. E <laughs> I don't even mean it to like demean them. It's like games that, you know, didn't review as well or whatever. They still yes. often have, they're like still going for something mm -hmm. in almost every case. They like the developers of those games set out. Everybody wants to make something good at the start of a totally. project. So it's like, what yes. happened? You ran out of time or it went off the rails for some reason. So just like the archaeology of, you know, what happened here? What were they, what were they trying to achieve? Um, yes. is really interesting to me and sometimes like when you play an immaculate game they that just makes it look easy it, it's like an alien artifact it, it actually sometimes <laughs> teaches you less because it's just like perfection you know beyond reach but when you play a bad game you're like dude i maybe i could have done better than that and that fills you with that feeling of like m being motivated to try it but if i play a naughty dog game it like makes me want to quit being yeah. a game developer or what it's like <laughs> dude i it, it's this is still sorcery to me i i have no idea how you did any of this so honestly uh, i couldn't i you know the the one two punch of ghosts of tsushima and yeah. uh last of us part two it's like almost telling people don't bother with the ps5 because the ps4 is you know it's so damn good i couldn't tell if it was like a commercial to not upgrade or to uh, where do you see what they've got coming up next? Because yeah. they were just so far and away, just extraordinary pieces yeah. of of, of it, work. It's one of those great things that happens at the like at the end of a console cycle. Finally, everyone is like, I know the system cold, and they like make yes. they make these consoles shine. And then it's like, well, that's it. Time to time to like stumble around and learn the next thing and kind of start start that's over. Of course, it's a really fun process, but yeah, even even back in the day, we were talking about like. Super Nintendo games, you know, Chrono Trigger, these like latter day Super Nintendo games um, are some of the best ones. Oh, amazing. I know. And just think about if people were able to continue making games with that kind of, you know, like I, which is what you guys are doing in that, a way, that's right? Like, like, that's exactly how we, th it's cool that you said that because that's like literally how we think about it of like an alternate reality where, you know, games never went 3D and people just kept trying to make, you know, two yeah. cool 2D games. So we, we, I we talk about that all the time. Yeah, because it's it is like a new breed of of game creator had to emerge when right. everything went 3D. It's like, and so many people, you know this, so many people that had thrived in 2D yeah. game making, they left the business when everything right. went to 3D. Dude, there was just I, no I space for them anywhere. I think they only figured out how to do 3D cameras like in the last like maybe five years or so. I know. Like it took it took like 25 years to like make a decent 3D camera in a, in totally. a yeah. So it, it definitely was not like. It wasn't just a straight improvement. Something I I was enough of like a two D game snob that I'm like, man, I, I I miss some of this stuff. I wish it didn't get like replaced wholesale. Now obviously there there's a lot more like diversity and variety in terms of what kind of games there are and like a lot yeah. obviously a lot more two D games out there as well as three D. Are you a retro guy? Do you go back and play classic stuff much? I uh, um I, I do like a fair amount. Like I got the uh, I I was really excited that they had the what was it the the turbo graphics mini it's like a pretty oh, obscure so si yeah yes. it's a pretty obscure yeah. system but some of the games on there like east book one and two a game called lords of thunder which has like one of the best soundtracks ever and it came out in 1993 um so i i do like to go back to that old stuff um because i think you know back then like all developers could do was just focus on whatever was the essential aspect of, of it. they just had to make kind of one thing work really well uh they didn't have to make you know achievements just, they it wasn't as like complicated uh, yeah. to make a game overall sorry complicated isn't the word they just had to make a good game within far greater constraints than there are yes. today um yeah. so like if they made a really great feeling game for example or a game with like a really uh, exciting progression system they must have really nailed how that works and there's probably like a really distinct lesson to be learned in that uh i i, yeah, so, I think yeah. the ceiling was a known entity for all the creators back then like they knew how far they could go and i don't think creators now know that and the, or, and so yeah you're not limited you're not limited by like you can draw you know eight characters on the screen or display 16 colors right yeah there yeah. aren't those kind of limitations um and and back then yeah like working within those kind of constraints developers still did like incredibly amazing work um so uh yeah i i think there's so much especially from that 16-bit era you know you could you could go back to these games like super metroid and they're still just absolute master class perfect. design perfect yes yeah. i agree uh yeah I, I mean i i can't believe how much retro content i make 
in 2020. Like if you had told me this and in, in when I started EP that, it, you know, 25 years in, I'd be playing 16 bit cartridges as much as I am yeah. and making content around them, I wouldn't have believed you. And it's, it's so valuable though, right? To go back yeah. in the history of our medium and to kind of discuss it and learn from it. And the camera comment that you made is so absolutely perfect. Like I, I'm reviewing the poly mega system. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's where uh, you can attach different components, different modules uh, for cartridges, but it comes with a, a oh, CD, right, right. CD sort of mother base. Yeah. And it plays Sega CD and Saturn oh, and man. PlayStation one and Neo Geo CD and Turbo Graphics CD games yeah. out of the box, which is incredible. Yeah, that's amazing. But playing old PlayStation one games, where they only had digital controls, but oh, they were supposed boy. to be in 3D. It's like, yeah. What? No, that, it's funny because, yeah, like some of these games, you know, Super Metroid, it's it's this like genuine classic. You could play it now. It still looks beautiful, plays great. But yeah. but those early PlayStation 1 games, who boy, they, yep. they for the most part, they do not, they're really hard to play. Uh, some old computer games are like that too. Like, you know, there, there are these games like XCOM that are, the original XCOM, it's heralded as a classic. But if you try to play that game today, Ooh, it's rough. Just be just like the interface and that sort of thing. It's like a lot of those standards have really evolved to make some of those old games feel like borderline unplayable now. But but the old, you know, kind of console two to six button, you know, D-pad type game like that, that thing never goes out of style. And still, it never does. Still holds is, up well. Is there one or two that you can point to that set you on this path? Uh, well, I, I mentioned I mentioned the old I was always like. Man, I always played everything. I was fortunate to have access to computer games. I spent tons of time in video arcades and I played console games as well. So I'm like a weird, thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, for me, it's like Japanese games and Western games uh, have both really uh, significantly um, influenced my work. Um, and I, you know, some of the old like 16 bit Final Fantasy games were I think really formative for me about um, when it comes to storytelling and games and like how just yeah. how incredible like char characters and like story set pieces can be where the music and the writing and 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 the story all like come together in some amazing moment so i i the, think back to those games often yeah the opera scene in final yeah. fantasy three final six yeah right, right or six yeah uh i mean i remember playing that and going yeah i mean th those were formative for me to think of a t you know what i was going to do with my life too you know it was really like the on-ramp to recognizing the cultural value of this medium was right. really present and evident and stuff like that. So Final Fantasy is what you can kind of... You, you know, it's funny. It's the first to. thing that came to mind, but like like Japanese role play, like Fantasy Star for the Sega Master System I played as a Sweet. kid, but that game, that game really stuck with me too. Um, it's kind of like a pro... To, uh, uh, Fantasy Star 2 as well, actually, like... Um, some of those old Japanese RPGs, they really stuck with me. And like my my instincts on storytelling in games um, are definitely informed by games like that. But I played so many, like I, I played fighting games nonstop through the 90s. Awesome. So, so on the flip side, you know, not only was I playing these like really kind of story heavy games, but I was also playing games that were like the exact opposite of that. Mechanics Basically based. no story. Yeah, pure mechanics yeah. based. But those games are like, when someone's good at fighting games, it's like a it's like a piano concerto or something. Totally. They're just like virtuosic performances, and th those make you realize, you know, how intricately complex, you know, the the play aspect itself can be. So I'm really fascinated with that as well. Were your folks all cool with your obsessions here? Were they <laughs> into it with you, or you know, bl bless them. They were. They're like, hey, if your grades don't suck, I'm not gonna sweat you too much. And part of the thing I said before of. Um, me trying to do something productive with it. I, th I think that kind of kept some of the heat off me. I'm like, oh, I'm yeah. writing about them. You know, I'm doing this thing because they um, I was I was born in Moscow, actually. So my my father's a I was only like two and a half or so when when my family immigrated to, to this country. Um, and, and my my parents are like traditional professionals. When my father is an engineer and my mother's a neurologist, like a, like a brain, brain doctor. So they wow. both wanted me and my brother to go into these like traditional fields and they and my brother did not go into traditional fields either and so they were they were like they were losing their minds for a while they, they were really concerned. but but um you know once i i actually like found employment with GameSpot, they're like well that's huh they kept asking me what would i do in five years but then five right. years passed and at a certain point they stopped asking <laughs> so. and, and honestly i don't i don't even know what occupation 
you can project that in anymore in 2020 yeah. at all. like you know what it's like i mean we're we've been doing this a long time and i'm sure we meet younger people all the time and they tell you their job title and their job title just sounds like they made it up like it, it like it was written in a science <laughs> yeah. fiction book it's like what that's a job <laughs> you know it's the world is changing so quickly yeah. that it's it's just hard to imagine all that they must feel incredibly proud of what you've been able to achieve in your career at this point they, they they've been they've been really really supportive and i owe like i owe i mean i owe everything to them um they i wouldn't have been able, like a super giant had no money when we started like we only had money to like like ship a video game we didn't have money to to like pay everybody like yeah standard wages so i i was able to take um uh i i was fortunate to be able to take like, essentially like a huge pay cut from my perfectly good job i had before to go join join the guys at super giant like thanks to my parents basically helping fl float my rent for a while you know so awesome. and, and not everyone is uh not everyone is so lucky and i i just try to i'm like hey if i'm going to be fortunate enough to be able to do this then yeah like i said the least i could do is just try to try to work for it um so that so you're gonna that, you're gonna have to pay it forward with your kids now it would it, it, you know they my my daughter's very she's very artistically she's a she's an amazing artist actually she she's 15 today happy birthday that's oh that's um, so cool but she, uh, she um she's an amazing artist for for 15 and my son plays games like nonstop. but they um i didn't push games onto them i swear yeah they yep. were just around the house all the time and <laughs> i think i i think games are inherently cool and and i think if my kids discovered this but my you know my wife isn't um, she, she doesn't play games besides the occasional like uh, Animal Crossing or something like that. So yeah, um, it's, it's, not, it's still not for everybody, but um, for people... Oh, I think people are finding games, especially now, this year. I, yeah. It couldn't be more important for this Seriously. medium, right? Absolutely. Like, you, you're, there's only so many like seasons of shows on Netflix before you need a new hobby, yeah, in my opinion. Totally. <laughs> totally. Games, are, and, games are perfect right now. Yeah. And I don't know how it is for you, but I, you know, I've been watching some shows and some movies, but I'm finding it much difficult, much more difficult to lose myself in them because yeah. the realities of this world keep creeping into my head as I'm watching something passively, but I can escape into interactive entertainment and sort of block out some of the, you know, negative things for us to worry about, especially as parents much yeah. easier this year. I don't know what it is. You know, I mean, it's maybe it is a, a, a communal, um, like a, like CNN has reached out to me this year and I, I've been commenting on titles that have been coming out and that's been a great honor, but that hadn't happened ever before. Right. But I think that there is this kind of universal thing in our across our medium at every studio at every like there's a responsibility now, you know, and like more people are waking up and realizing how powerful and yeah. how much more potential games have than right. we've even scratched the surface up, you know? I, I, I totally get what you're saying. I, I feel as though that responsibility has always been there, but I think it's been harder to recognize in the past. Um, yes. it, it's, uh, it's always been, you know, I think it's always been the responsibility of creators to be thoughtful about what they're doing. But it's like, yeah, sometimes you look back at stuff and it's like, well, it, hindsight is twenty twenty on everything. And yeah. I, I, I think man on some level it's like i do it, it's an interesting thing to think about on some level there's a sense almost like a loss of innocence around it of like <laughs> designers shouldn't be like people don't need to like second guess their every decision and be incredibly self-conscious about everything they do like that, that at some point that gets in the way of the craft and of the art i think it, like so many wonderful things are created like purely from the heart of like man yeah. i don't know what you were thinking but bless you this is amazing like no one else would have made this and you just you just chased your passion and you did it so i sometimes worry that uh, man i like, like creators shouldn't get too um they, they, they people should still follow their hearts with what they with what they create yeah. i think um but yeah, but yeah I, these I, these days there is a burden of responsibility i know what you're saying yeah i mean well and I, but i i think that there is a commercial responsibility that will always exist but i think there also is this um uh, this creative responsibility and Fall Guys and Animal Crossing, yeah. I think, really underline oh, that too, right? Like just yeah, the like, go, Animal go Crossing. For it. Yeah, talk talk about the right game at the right time for so many people. Yeah. Like, a, yes. you know, not something Nintendo uh, planned for, obviously, but like, man, here's this game where you just chill and 
be friendly with people. Um, it's perfect. Yeah, and stuff like Fall Guys and Away Team. It's like, huh, turns out, well, Away Team, I guess people actually die. But if, yeah. uh, they're, they're like, um, they're these like cartoony, you know, they're not games about like sick head headshots or whatever. It's like, yeah, they're, they're, they're alternatives to these kind of, there isn't like one default like mainstream yeah. gaming experience. But I mean, yeah, what we, I, we've known what, this, Rocket League and all kinds of We stuff. know this, yes. The outside world still is learning this. Yeah, and yeah. what I always tell people, you, you know, because we've had this wonderful platform of being able to reach people on, a, on TV that generally, you know, they, they dip in and out of their awareness of what's going on in games. But what I try to convey all the time is that there is a game for you, no matter Absolutely. what you're into. You know, there is like there is something that you will really enjoy, and yeah. and you you don't have to default to a match three game on your phone. There are lots of ways that you can spend your time in this, yeah. you know, in this world and have a great time with it. Let's, even let's go back do, to, pardon me. I was gonna say, and even if you do default to match three, like get like Grindstone or something. They're like awesome totally. ver versions of that yeah. game. Yes, so. or yeah, what well, the uh, the one that um um Super Meat Boy guy made as well was really cool too. I forget the name oh, of it. It's not on mobile it. yet. I it's fantastic. Oh, it's cool. great. It's it's only on Steam. I forget the name of it, and and uh, it's not the uh, end of it's die, right? No. Yeah. I, I could... Like a puzzle, like a matching game. I, I it doesn't come to mind for me right now. Yeah. Anyways, it was yeah, yeah. it was super fun. Um, but let's go back to you transitioning from GameSpot and working with the super giant guys. Um, you know, obviously. W now it's a lot more sophisticated. There are lots of schools, there are lots of programs, the jobs, especially in established uh, studios are much trickier to kind of connect with and there needs to be some kind of education or experience tied to a lot of that employment. And there was a long period in games where you could go from a retail to uh, you know mm -hmm. uh, a fanzine or a website and then you're working in a studio. And I feel like a door got closed a little bit and, and you may have come in just as that transition was starting to happen where you really had to kind of know your stuff before you could get into an opportunity to make video games or you had to go out and do it all on your own with the people that you started working with was there a, um, a skepticism that you would be as a writer that you would be able to do game making as well yeah so so before you know i left GameSpot first to go to electronic arts in los angeles oh, and that's, that's right. where yes. yeah so that's where i met the guys um who then founded Supergiant, who I still work with to this day. Um, at, you know, at Electronic Arts, it's funny, it, like I, I absolutely did uh, luck into it to some extent because I, you know, at, at GameSpot, we, uh, we had, we had I, I would say, very strict uh, editorial standards. And one of those things is like, you, you cannot have a connection to studios whose work you are reviewing. And totally. I reviewed a lot of games therefore i didn't know i basically didn't know nobody even though a lot of people knew of me because i was mm -hmm. the editor-in-chief of GameSpot, but i i did not know them so i'm like i have this desire to become um a game developer but i'm like man what do i do do i just like apply for a job like that i'm not i'm not qualified on paper but i have this yeah. i have these other qualifications that i think um do like can make me effective here and one of the one of the things that was really important was uh, for me was that um you know GameSpot is a big website and i was i was like kind of running the product team there so i was working with artists and programmers like i was having like legitimate production experience there in addition to the editorial work i was doing so i actually kind of sold myself on that basis more sure. than the part where i know a bunch about games i'm like i work with teams that are analogous to the teams that you have here and and it was it, it actually did very much uh, prepare me um but but it was one of my former colleagues uh, amira jami he'd gone to work uh, at Electronic Arts before me, he was a friend of mine. He knew I. He's like, we're looking for a producer. Do you still want to do game stuff? Or and I'm like, yeah. And I applied and I got it. Um, so th it was kind of uh, it, it was fortunate that that happened. Um, and from there, I. But you know, doing production work there, like they weren't gonna tell me to go write their story or something like that. Of course not. So yeah. it was only through working with these guys, Amir and Gavin. They saw both where my interests were and where some of my like demonstrated ability was because I was writing everything that I could, you know, unit responses, the the game manuals, you know, website posts, and people were like, "Oh, this stuff's good." Um, they, cool. they they liked it, so I kept getting these little small opportunities to write. Um, so when the time came, 
for Supergiant, we just like, yeah, we created positions around the stuff that we really wanted to do. Uh, for, for Amir, you know, Supergiant's co-founder, he like, he, he was like a rank and file designer, one of many designers on like a Command and Conquer game. No one was about to tell Amir that he was going to be like lead designer on a whole project. It took him starting a studio to get to be essentially lead designer on the project. Um, right. and, and for my part, you know, I didn't get to build levels or write or write stories for games until my friends had the faith in me to give it a shot. Um, so I, I just, you know, yeah, I, I it's it's one of those it's not what you know it's who you know types of things I, I feel horrible saying that because I'm I'm like terrible at like networking with people and yet even still I look back at my past it's like man these connections are what made it happen for me well but here's the truth in that though and and you know games are such an incredibly collaborative medium yeah. and if you can you know prove to other teams that you know what it's like to work in a team there's a, there's a, an opportunity is going to present itself to you. And I think the other truth about games, even though it is more difficult and, and the doors are um, maybe as not as wide open and the opportunities maybe not as diverse and spread out, it's still a, a, an industry that's defining itself. It's still, uh, you know, open to reinvention and reinterpretation. And, and uh, I think if you can come in with, uh, you know, the idea to collaborate and the ability yeah. to express yourself well and a real passion, I think, you're going to find a, a way it's going to be your way yeah the the i think the other thing that's really important is that the bar the barrier to entry has never been lower so it right. introduces it introduces other challenges but like you know the unreal engine used to cost literally a million dollars a year True. or whatever yes um yes. so that's obviously <laughs> beyond most people's means let alone yeah. most game studios um but now you you just download unity and there's nothing stopping you from making games um, other than like your time and your patience. And, you know, you need an internet connection and a machine that can run it. But that, uh, that barrier to entry is, is technically uh, low and, and like the means to create games are, are more accessible than ever before. But, but the, you know, the flip side of that is when everybody can create video games, it means the, the, the quality uh, yes. bar is really high. Um, and the quantity bar is also really high. Uh, <laughs> the discoverability, so, yeah. Yeah. So then, <laughs> how do you how do you get noticed? But in terms of like getting a uh, getting professional work um, in the industry, you know, you gotta. I feel like you gotta like making stuff is is the best way in because no, yeah, no yeah. one's. It's a catch twenty two. Everyone wants the previous experience, but how do you gain the experience until you're there? Yeah. You, you just gotta go do it. I think it's totally analogous in media as well, right? There yeah. is no barrier to entry. Everybody's got a computer or a phone, and yeah. that's all you need. You, you can, can make, make a YouTube stuff. channel and yep. you know just go, go for it. Yeah, and so that that's been a challenge to you know everybody that's been in media. So Gamespot yeah. and EP and everybody else out there has just had to contend with these solo, very industrious, very creative people. Yeah. And the game world is also filled with stories like that too, you know? Which yeah, is, which well, is I mean, you look at Fall Guys and Away Team, these are not games, you know, coming from Activision Blizzard, right? But they're yeah. they're at the absolute top of the charts. So, yeah, I, awesome. I mean, I, I think like, um, I mean, AAA game development, man, it's tough. It's really tough out there. You, you have to make, yeah, I mean, like, like you said, it's just, it's never it, no aspect of it i think has ever been easy at any point and no. just the moment people start to grok it yeah like the whole landscape changes and you have to so you're always having to kind of relearn everything and that's what makes it um i think that's part of what makes it so difficult like yeah i've been i i don't feel like maybe i'm maybe i'm better at my job now than i used to be but i don't i don't like feel that uh i feel <laughs> as capable as i felt when I was starting, but that feels like it should be uh, alarming to me because does my experience mean nothing and things like that? Like, man, it's always <laughs> been, it's always been hard. So, but, but I, I reconcile that because of, like, if it's hard, you know, it means you're doing something that is, is worth a damn, hopefully. Yeah. And you're challenging yourself, right? Like it's not, I, I it's so. not a cakewalk, right? Like you're trying to craft something that uh, levels you up personally. Do you, yeah. do you feel like Hades is the best thing that you've made so far? Like uh, I, I, you know, um, as as a as a team, I'm I'm beginning to become convinced uh, that that may well be true. We we haven't 
we've tried to avoid the mindset of just make something better, make something bigger and better every time because yeah. we get these amazing, you know, you get these emails from people that are like, some, some of our games have really, really impacted people. They like happen to those players. The, players found these games at the right point in their lives to where they really, really had like as much of an impact as possible. You know, they have tattoos of Bastion or something like, I'm not going to tell that person, Hades is even better than Bastion because Bastion <laughs> has like, Bastion has like a sacred place in the heart of that person. So the uh, we, we just try to make games that are at least on the level of what we've done in the past, but Hades is definitely the biggest game we've ever made. And um, like, like for me, for me personally, I think it does pull together everything that I've ever tried to do, like on the like narratively in our previous games. Uh, all the all the all the lessons I've learned and the and the things that were like the scariest to me to to pursue, we kind of got it all in here. So we, I definitely couldn't have done the the stuff that I personally worked on on this game prior, if not for the experience of the three games before it and i think it may well be that my my colleagues kind of down the line feel similarly so i guess that contradicts what i was saying before about about experience but yeah i you know i i think like i'm glad i'm glad that it, it, hades is a game that like is our most it's our most light-hearted game again despite appearances right. and i'm right. really glad that we set out to make a game that was going to um above all like make people we weren't trying to make people cry. We we're trying to make people happy. Um, and yep. I think I think making people sad is is highly overrated as like a <laughs> as like a measure of like the validity of media. Oh, we made we made you cry. Isn't this so sad? It's like making people sad is easy. Like try to make yeah. people feel fulfilled and content. And like what they experienced was like, man, that was that was great. Like try to give them that feeling. So that's that's what we. Uh, set out to do with Hades and make people feel good rather than feel bad. Um, and they're, they're starting to tell us that, that we did that. So it's really nice to that's hear. That's awesome. Well, there's connective tissue between all four of your games and you can feel the imprint of, of your creativity across them, but they're not sequels. And I'm wondering if that is a, uh, is that by choice? Or are we ever going to see a Bastion 2 or a Transistor 2? Or do you guys askew that? Do you guys just want to yeah. Kind of craft new things every time. Yeah, it's you know I think what we really value is is um, is that sense of surprise and discovery. So I think we want to keep sort of dodging expectations a little bit. Mm. Um, like no one expected us to make an early access roguelike dungeon crawler. I, I I can safely say. And then even once they heard we were doing that, they probably worried that it was going to kind of lose all of the quality, you know, they, it threatened to lose the qualities that made our game special in the past, like having a strong narrative component and a strong atmosphere in these things. But all those things are very much um, at the center of Hades even still. So I think we want to keep doing stuff that's like out of our creative comfort zone a little bit, but still playing to our strengths. Um, we are not, you know, the part where we've never made a sequel is like, it's not out of any sort of snootiness of like oh we would never do that like man um we love all the worlds that we've created and if only we could just kind of clone ourselves and work on a million things at once then i'm sure we would have you know multiple games and all of our worlds or something like that but we can only work on one thing at a time uh like kind of one big new game at a time so we try to choose the one that we're just the most excited about at the time the one that like kind of scares us but also excites us and in our case, it's been something different each time thus far. But I don't know. I, I honest to God, don't know what, what the future holds. Um, we don't. Uh, we do not know what our next game is going to be, or, or any of that sort of stuff. Like we, we have to see where the where the cards fall, uh, as it were. And we got to take a break, uh, quite frankly. And we right. and and sort of gather our bearings and see where we're at. Um, and make yeah, because you've decisions. just hit version 1.0 yeah. of Hades, right? You've just yeah, launched. That's right. Like. The start, like their true starting point of the game, or the true, or the true end point, really. As it were, yeah. we're saying, the game is done finally after right. after like in nearly two years in early access development, where we were had a pretty relentless pace of these big updates, you know, every month or two. Now we're saying the game is complete, the true ending is there, and it's a huge game for people to sink their teeth into. And we're absolutely like supporting the launch um, and it, it kind of keeping an eye on things and making sure 
it's as problem free as possible and you know if people playing games on computers like there's always some issue that you have to have to solve there um but beyond beyond the initial launch we we have to uh, take stock of of what's next figure it out awesome Awesome. Well, I can't wait to find out what's next and uh, I'll definitely be uh, diving back into Hades and playing many, many more runs. And uh, I can't wait to have you back on the show and hopefully next time Thanks it will lot. be in person. Yeah, that would, that not would be over good. the zoom. That yeah. would be good. Well, yeah, congratulations. So oh, my pleasure, man. Congratulations on, uh, on all of your success at the studio and the launch of Hades. And uh, please give my regards to your teammates oh. and, uh, you guys all at home should go out and check out Hades from Supergiant Games. That was Greg Kasabin. Thank you so much for being on the show, Greg. Thank, thank you. you all for watching. We'll be back soon. And until then, play forever.